Hi, I'm Jacob Morris, a freelance vision mixer, and I'm also a Sony switcher demonstrator. In this extra video in the series, we're going to give you some top tips on how to get the best out of your MLS X1 switcher. First up, it's color backgrounds. Your switcher has two color background generators built in, so we're going to take a look at how to work with those now. If you double press the preview key of your color background, and in fact I'm going to take it to program 2 so you can see it, it'll take you to the other effects color background menu. We're in color background 1 here, and first I'm going to go to flat color and open the color picker. You get this nice UI on your screen with some preset colors down here that you can choose, and you can see my changes are being reflected in real time. There's some other options in there, maybe some pastel colors or some retro colors too. You can grab any you want and save them into user palettes, of which you have five. You just bring the colors in like that. You can also design your own color with the luminance slider, saturation, and hue options. I'm actually going to go into the mix color system, and we're going to generate a mat of two colors. So color one, I'm going to use this orange. And color two, I'm going to use a slightly more yellowy tone, which I'm going to customize slightly. And in case I need it later, I'm going to add it to my user palette just there. Now I can go to the mix pattern select, choose something with, say, a nice line to it, and then I can adjust that pattern just like I would a wipe. So there's a little bit of movement on screen, just like that. And that's how you'd use a color background on your MLS X1. Next up, it's preset color mix which is the ability to add a color or matte to your transition. So first of all, in the transition area, you've got a preset color mix button. And again, I'm going to double tap that to jump to the appropriate menu. First of all, we're going to set it up with a flat color. And in the same way as color backgrounds, we get a color picker. I'm going to use white in this case. When I execute the transition, you'll get a white flash in between. That will run at the speed I do it at. And it can also work on the auto trans button too. There's some other settings we can play with on this one. If I go all the way down to the switcher menu, and go to custom preset color mix, you'll see I've got some options per bank. First of all, single or normal stroke. In normal stroke mode, I go once to the color and once back. In single stroke mode, the center of my T-bar is the full color and it's a single stroke across. There's also a one-time enable switch which means that when I hit it and execute the transition, we go back to our previous option. If I turn that off, we'll be in preset color mix mode every transition until I change it. A nice extra feature of preset color mix is the ability to use your utility two bus signal as the color or matte in the center. So if I switch to utility two bus and pop a logo on utility two, this time when I execute the transition, we'll go through a logo. This is great if you've got a frame memory or clip saw with a little bit of a textured background or logo that you'd like to transition through. And that's how we can use preset color mix on the MLS. Now let's talk about putting macros anywhere on the panel. So we've already covered in some other videos in the series, running macros from the flex pad, such as this one, which will cut through some sources on my program output. But what if I want to run that macro from some other areas of the panel? Well, let's see what we can do. First of all, we can do attachments, which we've also covered elsewhere, such as this one, which is a replace attachment on this row. And in fact, I can attach that as many times in as many places as I'd like. And you'll see some green indications there. I could also add it to a crosspoint pad. So if I came to a blank page, let's say page 13, came over to my menu, went to panel, module, wait for the graphic, Pick the area I want to modify, and let's go to page 13. And I'll add a macro recall there too. Macro, and in this case, it's going to be macro 11. And now I can run my macro from there too. But there's lots of other places we might choose to do that. I can do the same in the utility pad. Again, heading over to the panel module menu, I can take a look at the utility pad. This is where we can set the different pages but we're going to go to Utility Function Assign and add some buttons there too. So I'm going to choose a button on the second row, which is going to be button 17 in this case. I'm going to add a macro to it, and again, I'm going to make that macro 11. That's called PP Cuts, and I can run it from there too. 
that's just some of the ways I can run macros all over the panel. I can even run them from the utility pad down here by calling up macro 11 and hitting enter, and my macro will run again. So we can run macros pretty much anywhere on the MLS X1. This next tip is also about macros. So let's talk about macro multi-mode. Heading over to the menu, going to panel, and then custom, and then effect timeline slash macro mode, we can turn on macro multi recall mode. That allows me to run up to 16 macros simultaneously from anywhere on the panel, and I'll show you how that works. First of all, I have that uh, program preview cuts macro I ran before. You're seeing some cuts through. If you take a look at the right hand monitor, I also have ME2 program one in the corner, and I've got a macro that will also cut between sources on ME2 program one. With multi macro mode on, I can simply run both together from the flex pad, and both of them will run in sequence, and you're seeing the cuts on both MEs. I can also run one of them and attach them somewhere, just like we did in the previous tip. So we'll attach one there, run the other one, and attach the other one too. I can also run them both from the panel, and you'll see both of them flashing at me on the indicator to show that they're running together. If I want to get those out of the way, I've still got the macro attach enable option, and those buttons are back to a normal function. So multi-macro mode is really useful for running a large number of macros together, up to 16, as I said. And that can be really useful if you've got one running a title sequence or headlines, and you need to run other functions underneath without disturbing the original one. Another great feature of the MLS X1 is network messaging, which as you've just heard, I've used to trigger some external audio devices to play sounds directly from the switcher. So what we're doing today is we're using Spot On Audio, which is a piece of playout software, very common in control rooms, and we are sending TCP messages to it to make the software respond, such as these ones, where you'll see the software is playing based on my commands. So how do we do that? In a macro, we have a command called network messaging. And if I load up the thing I've just run, which is called drumroll, you'll see there's a network messaging command. It's going to device one, which we've set up uh, as shown in the manual, and it's sending a string of text, which is in the macro command. The string of text we're sending is spot on underscore play underscore 15. Though this could be anything at all. The beauty of network messaging is it allows us to communicate with any device we can imagine as long as it will listen for TCP commands on a certain port. This allows us to move away from PBUS, from GPI control, and even VTR control systems such as AMP if we choose. TCP messaging is completely open and we can develop it ourselves. We've seen this used for video wall control, in some UK broadcasters where custom protocols have been set up, and it's also being used for graphics in other places too. It's fantastic with open source tools like Casper CG. So this one is really limited by whatever you can come up with. So let's create a new command quickly just to show how quick and easy it is. I'm gonna exit that, and I'm gonna find a new macro. I'm gonna do this on register 16. So we go to add a new event, and that event is going to be called network messaging. I'm going to go to device one again, and the command I'm going to send is spot on underscore play underscore 39, which is going to play sound 39 in our spot on library. So I'm going to store that, and that's stored, and hit macro 16, and it's as easy as that. Now let's talk about the internal multi-viewers and how we can control them with macros. So heading over to the menu, we can go down to switcher and multi-viewer. We've got four multi-views to play with. We're just gonna work with multi-view one for now, so that's the one here. You can see we've got a clock in the bottom left corner. I'm gonna change that to now to be clip two, perhaps. So clip player one, two, whatever I choose. Now the nice thing with that is I can actually record that into a macro. So I'm going to favorite this page so it's nice and quick for me to get to at the bottom. I'm going to go back to macros and I'm going to record a macro on number 28. Turn on auto insert. There's another video covering macro creation in this series. So feel free to head there for a little bit more on that. We're going to go over to the multi viewer and I'm going to change the bottom four to be my clips. So let's say clip player one is going to be there. Clip player two is going to be there. Clip player three will be there. 
and finally clip player 4 will be there. When I go back to my macro, you'll see four menu commands changing that, and I can store that. Earlier I built a button to add a clock to the bottom left corner, which is there, and you can see it fires instantly. And when I run the macro I just built, it also switches straight back. In fact, I can make any changes at all that I'd like to and mess up what we've just made like that and know that that button will instantly correct things. And you can see it's a super fast way of recalling multi-viewer presets. We've been talking a lot in this video about changing things in the menu, but sometimes it's nice to use the physical hardware on the panel to control parts of the menu. So first of all, let's go to, say, a key resizer. So we'll drop to ME2 key 1, and we'll turn that on just to see what we're doing. And pop a nice background behind it too. So we can see we've got a box on the left-hand side of the screen. If I go to the resizer menu, I have some hardware control over here that can move things around on the screen like that. That's not always the most precise way of doing it, so let's look at some other ways to control these areas on the right-hand side of the screen. First of all, on the key control module at the top of the desk, I can go to Menu. This is how it will look normally. When you hit Menu, you get your menu options represented on the right-hand side. As you saw there, we can toggle that on and off whenever we want. And you'll see I have Location X, Location Y, and Size. And they work just as they would in the menu, and you can see it on the right-hand side of the screen. This is really great for more detailed menu functions like CG Border, which we covered in another video, but it works in any menu on the system, including, say, the color picker. So I can go into color backgrounds again, back to my flat color, and now I can change the colors with the knobs on the desk, just like that. So that's an easy way of controlling the MLS X1's new browser-based menu with the hardware panel. Up next, let's talk about another great feature of the new menu system, and that's one to help you remap areas of the panel, including custom buttons on the transition area, your flex pad buttons, and some buttons around your utility shopbox module. So heading over to the menu homepage, we're going to go to Setup. We're going to go to the Panel and Module menus. And you'll end up here, where you get a nice graphical representation of your physical panel, which makes it really easy to find the module you're looking for. So let's talk about our flex pad on Program Preview first. Click there, and you can see all of the white buttons around the flex pad are represented here. Now, the most useful thing you can do here is say we went to ME2 instead, so I'm going to switch my tick boxes to ME2. I can change which banks this points to. This is really useful in terms of macros because the factory setting has 0, 1, and 2 on your flexi pads, so it might make sense to have 3, 4, and 5 on your panel. So I'm going to change those now to be rather than bank 0, they are going to be bank 3, bank 4, and bank 5. So now, all I need to do is change the labels. You can see we're on the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, as discussed. All I need to do is change the labels on those buttons, and I'm ready to use a different set of banks on this flexi pad. So let's head over to the transition area next. We're going to back out of that one, back to our setup menu, and we're going to go to the transition area on Program Preview. And again, you'll see all of these white buttons that I can remap. That actually does include the key area as well. So if I prefer to have keys 1 to 4 on the top row and 5 to 8 on the bottom row, I can do that and swap the button labels or any other combination. In fact, I can have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Whatever you're used to, whatever you prefer as an operator, you can execute that. To the left of the T-bar, you can see all the other buttons in our transition area. And as we tap into them, the system will offer me the buttons I can use. So for example, I don't have to have the background and key delegation buttons there. I can also choose to have any of the other functions from the transition area available. Swapping them around completely, I could have background down here. That's totally up to you. In fact, lots of people choose to change the functions down here to, example, use a different clip wipe. So maybe a frame memory 1 and 2 clip wipe in the default space and a frame memory 3 and 4 clip wipe there. Once again, you can change the button cap labels to what suits you depending on what you've chosen in this menu. You may also wish to swap around the auto trans and cut buttons as required by some operators. That's in a slightly different menu, but it's easy to find. Panel, custom, operation mode, and down here we have auto trans and cut swap. When that's illuminated, the auto trans button will become a cut like that, and the cut button will become an auto trans button. So you can just swap the labels over. So that's just some of the areas we can remap in this menu. 
pretty much anything you see in front of you can be modified, so feel free to customize the switcher exactly to your requirements. Next up, let's talk a bit more about the transition module. First of all, the All button. This one is a pretty handy feature. So currently, I've got the All button set when I hit it to trigger keys 1 and keys 8 into my transition, though that is user customizable. So if we go to the Setup menu, Panel and Custom, you'll see an area here called Next Trans All. This allows me to define which of these properties is included when I hit the All button. So at the moment, that really is everything. Though often you may just have, let's say, two or three keys that are permanently on air with graphics engines that you'd like to lose going into a break, we could set the All button up to do that. In this case, I'm going to choose key 1 and key 8 only, which is my bug and box in the corner. So when I hit the All button, the next transition will be executed without those keys included. All, and they're included. That's an easy way of managing that. Also, we might want to go to a break or an item clean. So at the moment, I've got those two keys on air. If I double press my background button, the system will automatically set my transition to go clean to the next. Transition through, and those keys are gone. If I double press again, it's going to do nothing. So whatever state my switcher happens to be in, a background double press will always set me up for a clean next transition. Whichever keys are in, double press, clean next transition. So that's a really handy way of using the transition area to help get you in and out of big elements like brakes or similar. Another great tip is using the trackball to control multiple things at the same time. So for example, if we modify ME1 key 1 here, which you'll see on the left of the screen, I can move it individually. That works on any of the keys, as described, but I can also multi-select like a transition. So if I select all four, I can move them together. I can bring them on and off screen, and it's a really easy way of tidying up boxes once I've built them to lift them up or bring them down. Just a quick tip to help you with building things nice and quickly across the MEs on your MLS X1. The last thing I'm going to show you is the show key mode. In this case, we've got a weather presenter on ME2, which is cut to line, and she's on key 5. I can bring her on and off just like that. Now, sometimes when working with a chroma key, it's really useful to be able to see exactly where the keying edge is happening to help you with hair and edges. So if I push and hold the show key button on my key control module, you can see on my ME preview, I have a black and white key output to show me exactly what's happening when I let go. It goes back to normal. In the Setup Switcher custom menu under the Key and Wipe tab, there's a Show Key Hold Time option. So if we put 50 in there, that's a 50 frame hold. So when I hit the button, that's going to hold for 50 frames. Now I'm going to extend that to 500 for now, just so it stays there for a long time. And I'm going to go and have a look at the key. And as you can see, as I play with the Chroma Key options, you'll see the Show Key changing on the monitor. And it helps me get the key just right. I can turn it off again just by hitting the button. I hope this video and the others in the series have given you loads of information to help make the most out of your MLS X1 switcher. And remember the user manuals available under the three dot menu in the top right corner. Though of course, don't be afraid to reach out to your local Sony representative for more help and training information. Thanks for watching.